In this video I would like to discuss how we can deal with our attachments and our habits in our meditation. This is a quite difficult thing for us to do because of the structure of our brains. Basically how our brain works, it's a uh, categorization mechanism. So if we get the stimulus, we see something, what our brain does immediately is to categorize it. So if we see something moving, we will say it's a human, it's a dog, it's a car, and we will put it into a box. And as the brain matures, if, if we learn, we learn to subdivide that box into different smaller boxes, like okay, it is not just a human, it's maybe an elderly lady or it's a young child, and it's not just a dog, it might be actually your dog, and the car might be uh, a nice Porsche Coupe, or uh, might be a Buick Sedan, so you learn how to categorize more precisely. But it is still the habit of the brain, and also the function of the brain, to put things into categories. By putting things in a category, we can have an appropriate reaction. If we meet another human, we say, hey, how are you doing? If we see an animal, we might pet it and say, good dog. If we see a car, we might step off the road not to get run over. So the brain evolved this system and uh, it's ultimately a stimulus response system. We see something and then a certain array of responses is presented because there are common ways of dealing with such a stimulus. And ultimately we get very much into a habit of associating one thing with another and always reacting in the same way to that thing. So always when we meet a person we will say hi or shake hands and when we see our dog we will pat him on the head and when we see a car we will try to avoid it fine usually because those patterns will have formed with a reason but if we are meditating we also want to liberate ourselves we want to explore what are we doing why are we doing it and maybe we want to do something else for a change but this is not so easy because we get very attached and attachment is also a pattern of stimulus response so if i see my favorite food, I become happy. Stimulus, response. If the woman I love uh, has to go away for a while, I miss her. If I see her again, it makes me happy. And these are certain patterns. And it makes it easy. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to choose how to respond to a certain situation because you already have decided upon a pattern. But it can also become a source of suffering because I might want my favorite food but I don't have the ingredients or I don't have the money or something like this happens and then where to go with your desire, with your attachment. Same also if you love somebody, but if the person isn't there, you're going to cry yourself to sleep every night. Or if you're in love with somebody and it's not mutual, similar situation. So ultimately, we have to decide what is our goal, what do we want to achieve, and what reaction will help us to achieve that. And sometimes it can be good to indeed become upset or to become stressed, but more often than not it is actually um, a counterproductive reaction. We are in a way making things worse for ourselves and making things worse for our environment because of our attachment, because of our inflexibility in our behavior, in our methods of uh, responding to situations. So we occasionally need to break the mold and to explore different options and 
to do that is very very difficult. It is like trying to see your own back because our habits are in a way creating our world. What we think is positive is so because it is our habit to regard these things as positive. And what is negative is also negative because it's our habit to see those things as negative. So I might think slavery is a bad thing because I've always fought this, people around me have fought this, so this is my pattern to think of slavery as a very bad thing. Theoretically I could think about it in a very different way, like gosh, um, it is one person taking responsibility over another person's life and caring for their each and every need and it's in a way a mutual thing between the slave and the slave master because they have a mutual obligation towards each other. Very different pattern, but not a pattern which I'm used to thinking. So, the first thing we need is to realize the possibility that we are ultimately free in how we experience something, in how we see something, in what we consider good or bad, high or low, which way we move. And we have, in a way, programmed ourselves, and also society has programmed ourselves to react in a certain way. Because if there would not be any consensus, it would be very difficult to have a society to really coexist. You need a common language, you need a common goal or a common system. Um, so you can, in a way, create a model of how your actions will be perceived, what effect your actions will have. So these conventions have their purpose. But if we stick with these conventions, nothing will ever change. So it's important to be able to challenge these conventions, to be a little bit creative, a little bit artistic, with our own mind, with our own reactions. To liberate ourselves from ourselves and from our environment. And of course there are chemical ways to do that, using drugs. Um, we often do it in a way naturally, while we sleep, because in our dreams we often do things we wouldn't dare to do uh, in our daily lives. Um, so the taboos which we usually put upon ourselves tend to disappear in our dream state. And also in our meditations we should be a little bit playful. Um, it's also important though that we realize that we are building a new foundation for ourselves. And if the foundation is kind of like crooked, then also everything built on it will be crooked and ultimately slide down. So we should be playful, but we should not be too inconsistent and we should always keep our plan in mind, our goal in mind. What do we want to achieve by meditating? What do we want to achieve as a spirit um, in the form of growth or experiences or um, changing the world or the people around us. So if we have this goal, this purpose, then we can say like, okay, what moral structure should, would fit that? What should be good? What should be sought after? and What should be avoided? So once we have this goal, we can set about of building new habits. But this is usually a quite daunting task. Because here we cross in a way from the terrain of the spirit into the domain of the ego. The ego is a survival mechanism and it doesn't like to have its yeah, patterns disrupted because something which you experienced before, which you have survived, is considered safe. And something new, even though it is maybe very nice and light and loving, is very, very scary for the ego. <laughs> because it hasn't had that before, it hasn't experienced that before, it doesn't know what will happen, and it might kill you. Your survival might be at stake, you might be too relaxed or too peaceful, and 
than just lie down in the middle of the road and get run over by that car instead of being wary of it. So the ego needs to cooperate if we want to change our patterns. So for the ego to be able to cooperate it needs to be in a non-stressed, non-excited state. It needs to mellow out a little bit. So it will allow the spirit to do its thing. So for the ego to mellow out you can create optimal circumstances in your meditation. It usually means to create a situation where you're very isolated, very safe, so you're either alone or with friends or in nature. Uh, there's nothing which can intrude on you. You aren't expecting visitors. You don't have to watch the time. Uh, you turn off your phone. And also mentally you remove yourself from the situation you're in, from the stress you have within your family, within your relationship, with your work, uh, with your duties. Because all these impulses will feed the ego. They will strengthen the ego because the ego has to cope with all the stress which is put upon your system. So remove all these stress factors so the ego can start to mellow out a little bit. Because ultimately you want it to in a way go to sleep enough so that it will listen to your spirit, to the guidance which you're trying to give yourself the new opportunities which you're trying to create for yourself. So once you have created this safe environment, start feeling more and more distance from all these things which are stressing you, which are troubling you. And tr stop taking them so seriously. Because to the ego, they are very serious. Your feelings for anybody else, your moral standpoint is a very serious thing. It's the foundation of all your thoughts, of who you are, of your personality. But for the spirit, these are just playthings. It is about growth. It is not about staying yourself, remaining true to yourself. It's about growing, adapting, learning, it's allowing other influences to work upon you, to shape you, to erode certain parts of your being and to build up other parts of your being. So ultimately your spirit should be your sculptor. And the world is just adding material for your spirit to sculpt. And with every new thing which is, comes into your life, you have an opportunity of thinking of it as a good thing, as a bad thing, as a useful thing, or as a useless thing. And to categorize it. And don't just do that with the new things coming into your life, but do that also with the things which are already existing in your life. Something which might have been good in the past might be an obstruction towards the future. If you're going in this process of changing your habits, it also really helps to create a good energy circulation in the body. So yoga postures, um, tai chi, uh, martial arts can really help to make the body flexible but also to make the energy body flexible so the energy patterns which are in existence can move and by moving they can start transforming so if your body is very stiff very rigid it's also very difficult to change your patterns to change your opinion but if you have a more soft more flexible body also makes it a little bit more playful how to work with things, how to deal with problems. So if you're relaxed and you have enhanced the flexibility of your body, then we can start with enhancing the flexibility of your mind. 
The first thing is splitting categories of things which are considered completely good and completely bad. And just all these things, split them in two and see that every good thing has a bad side and every dark thing has a good side. A person might be a criminal or evil regarding to you, but they also have the possibility to grow. They also have intelligence or cunning or they might challenge you to grow. And everything which is good has a downside, like you might be very comfortable and happy sitting on the couch with your cat, something to drink, watching TV. And you can be completely content and blissful. But also you're completely frozen and stagnant. You're not growing, you're not evolving. It's like being frozen in ice. And by playing around and changing your perspective of things, you can also slowly but surely make your own mind more flexible and to get rid of your habits. It's also an animal is in a way dictated by their habits. They have a very strong instinct and this instinct which is created over many generations will dictate the thoughts, the actions and the emotions. But we as humans have the ability to rise over and above our instincts. Doesn't mean they're gone. We have xenophobia things which are alien to us seems threatening because this is our nature. Things which seem very similar, very regular, very perfect to us, we consider to be beautiful, we consider to be pleasant. People who think, behave, dress in the same way we identify with, we see them as being our group, our friends, our little society. And these are all instincts. And it's fine that we have these instincts, because ultimately this is our nature, and this is how we create society. But it's good to be aware of these instincts, and whether we should or shouldn't use them. If I meet a person who's dressed in the same way, should I regard him as my brother, my ally, or not? If a person is behaving in a way which I yeah, consider unpleasant? Should I consider him my enemy? Should I consider him immoral? Should I put him in the big category of all things evil? Or should I just accept he is behaving in a certain way and not judge him for it? But all these things become possible when we start to break down all these habits, all these structures. And always there will be a structure, there will be a judgment, an opinion, a reaction. Because this is the nature of our brain. What we can change is how we will react, what our thought will be and what our association will be. There will always be a system and either I'm caught in a system which is created by my environment, by my past, or I will be caught in a creation of my own. And this is the power of meditation, that you can, in a way, alter your patterns, alter your attachments, alter your feelings, even. And we become reborn, renewed. Because if you really get to know yourself, then you also start to realize the possibilities which are inherent within every human being, which are far superior to the abilities of self-management and self-transformation which animals have. So I hope that this has been helpful if you're suffering from these attachments. Good luck and enjoy your meditations.